Okay, I had a brother approach me about fires in Platicle. You can bring donations to the Platicle Fire Department. They need donations there. And lots of other things happening, aren't there, all around us. And yet, today we're looking at the Bible. We're taking a break from it all, right? That's what this is. You are. You are stopping everything else. Just drop it, and let's pick this up. This is 1 Peter chapter 4. And in this chapter, we hear from Peter about living differently. That's the title of the sermon, Live Differently. It's part seven of nine, To Live Christian Lives, the title of our sermon series, celebrating and strengthening the every generation purpose of our church. 1 Peter 4, 1 through 11, the word of God. Let's listen to this. Let's hear this. This is the inerrant, infallible, unalterable word of God. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that has passed suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, Keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks, as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves, as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you. You want us to, you want us to focus our attention on this and then be changed by it and then do it. We need your help every step of the way there. We won't do any of those things without your help, but with your help, we can do it all. And this is an amazing thing. And so we ask for that help. Holy Spirit, help now in understanding and applying your word to our lives. In your name, Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. So I was at work at the base. It's a chaplain, the military chaplain there at the base. And I was fasting. And... I, I ran into a snag in my fasting. I got hungry. <laughs> and sometimes, I, I, you know, it depends on the kind of fast and what I'm fasting about. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll bust through that. But other times I know I'm done. You know, I'm going to shut this thing down. And there's usually food everywhere. There's like cake from a farewell party or birthday party or cookies or such in the kitchen just kind of down the hallway from me or I have a cliff bar in one of my drawers, or I even brought stuff from home. But this day, there was none of these. I, I'd struck out completely. And then I remembered, there's a vending machine downstairs. So I grabbed enough change, you know, in my hand, went down, and there I was at the vending machine. It had typical ingredients, you know, the Snickers bar, the Skittles, uh, the different gummies, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, Cheez-Its and Fritos and famous Amos cookies, which I never heard of Amos before, but then he has those famous Amos cookies. They're tiny little cookies that make you want a real cookie. You know, that's what I, that's what I remember, you know. <laughs> like the teas, the, 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 the pre-cookie, you know. So I saw all that, but in the midst of all that, in the vending machine, I saw the trail mix. Oh, look at that. You got the nuts, the dried fruit. You got little bits of chocolate in there too, but I'm thinking that chocolate is just 
kind of like us, you know, it, it's formed by the company it keeps. And so there that chocolate is with nuts and fruit. So it's going to give me its best. You know, so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and commit to the trail mix. So I put my money in, put my number, put my letter. It fell down, dropped, you know, put my hand through the spring load, pick it up, look at it. And that's when I notice the best buy date. It was January 7th, 2024. I thought, well, it's within the year. <laughs> you know, I mean, and Best Buy, I mean, I don't require products or people necessarily to be at their best. All right, so I open that up and just kind of dump some of that right in my mouth, you know, chomp down on it. And here's the, here's the word, here's the word that describes what I was feeling at that moment stale definitely i mean the the nuts are a little dusty you know and the the dry fruit just kind of a little rubbery and the the chocolate had that that beige coating you know that sort of like light colored rust that shows up on old chocolate you still eat though you still eat it you know if you're serious but, uh, you know, much diminished. It kind of had a dead taste in my mouth. And it made me think, you know what? This reminds me of my life before God it was stale. Stale. It was dead. You know, this tastes stale in my mouth. It, just, it reminds me of life without God because life without God is stale. It is dead. In fact, Peter uses the word dead in the text we're looking at today to describe people who are physically still alive, but they are without or outside of God, stale. And what causes this deadness? Sin. And sin promotes itself, markets itself as the thing that's most fresh, most alive. But of course, it is the sole reason why anything is stale. It is the reason for death. In fact, it's why we die, says the Bible. We die because of sin. Sin brings death. The price of sin is death, which is why Jesus had to die on the cross. He had to suffer and die on the cross to pay the price for our sins, to set us free from sin and death and hell and staleness, all of it. He did it. And that's where, that's where Peter brings us in this text Brings us to Christ, what he's done, and how we're to live differently because of it. And so we start here, verse 1. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live for the rest of time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. So it doesn't mean that you're going to be sinless. You know, it doesn't mean that you'll attain a state of sinlessness, which none of us can attain to. Christ alone attained to that. That's why his sacrifice was effective, and his sacrifice would be the only one that would be effective. However, in Christ, we don't have to live for our sin anymore. We can live for Christ. We can live differently. We don't have to be stale. We don't have to live spiritually stale lives. In fact, it says here that we are to, to live the rest of the time we have not for human passions, but for the will of God. And it sets up this juxtaposition between human passions and the will of God. Human passions would be those, those things we do, that, the things we seek that are, that are sinful, that are away from God, that make us stale, that make us dead, spiritually and otherwise. And the will of God would be the opposite of that. And now Peter goes into detail about what this means. Like, here's, here's the difference in ways of living. Because you know, we're talking about to live Christian lives, and Peter's getting right into that. And Peter is, is a student of these different choices and knows uh, the benefit of choosing Christ as opposed to 
otherwise, choosing anything else, anything less than Christ. He says this, For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. So that's a little bit wooden in the way the English reads. And the reason for that is the type of translation we're looking at. So this is a, a essentially literal translation. That's actually the term for it. Essentially literal. The English Standard Version of the Bible that we use in our church for study. Other translations would be called dynamic equivalent translations. And they would be closer to the English. So they wouldn't be so difficult to read. So it's good to study because we're looking for content. We're looking to, to have our lives uh, be shaped by and, and, and influenced by, as much as possible, by the Word of God. And so the, the translations that are closest to the original, well, we like that. Except that we can make mistakes with that. And we can, we can, we can kind of lose the sense of what it means. So you have to slow down a little bit when you read. So for the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. And here's the list. Living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. It sounds to me exactly like my freshman year, 1983, at the University of Connecticut. Which was called, labeled, the number six party school in the United States of America. Which meant that every Friday morning, Saturday morning, and Sunday morning, when you went down to the end of the hallway in your dorm room to take a shower, you were playing hopscotch because you were trying to step around all the different little piles of vomit. And sometimes even the source of that pile of vomit, the unconscious student near the pile of vomit. Yeah. So what the verse is saying is, you're good. You've been there, done that. You don't have to waste any more time wasting time getting wasted. You don't have to do that. Christ has come. Christ is real. He's made a difference in you and set you up to live a different life. And, and the different life is secondary always to who he is. So you, you, don't, you don't use Jesus as a prop to your life. And this is one of the reasons why many of us are spiritually stale, maybe spiritually dead, even though we're surrounded by Christian things and Christian music and Christian books and Christian teachings all the time. But many of those books and many of, that, many of those songs and many of those teachings portray Christ as a, as a prop. Like, I, I go to Jesus and I have a good family now. I have a, it helps me with my family. I have, I'm successful. I've learned to be successful. I have peace in my life, peace in my heart. I feel better about this. I'm doing better here. I'm doing better there. Why? Well, Jesus is my life coach. Jesus is my cheerleader. Jesus is the source for me to live my good life. And you can, do you see how backwards that is? It is backwards. Jesus isn't the source you know, the, 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 the prop for your, your life that's more important than him. He's the thing that's more important than all this. You're headed on a collision course with an almighty God. You're headed to judgment day and an eternity in hell. Except that Jesus stands between you and that earned destiny. And so this is by far more important than all these other things that are important too. Your family, your marriage, success in life, these are all good things, except none of these things are the point of the gospel. Jesus is the point of the gospel. And so we've made that clear. Peter has made that clear. Peter has demonstrated the clarity of that and the consequences of some of the choices that he made. It's about Jesus, not about me and my better life. Because if it's about you and your better life, you know what's true about you? You're stale. It's, it's stale. It's boring. It's, it's, it's going nowhere. There's a deadness to it. Because the more distance between you and God, the more distance between you and life. Don't put your life in between you and God. Seek first, said Jesus. My kingdom and my righteousness. Seek first me. And then all these other things will be added as well. They're additions. They follow. First, it's him. It's about him. And then, 
a new life will result. And that new life will always be pointed back to him. That new life will be very different than what the world offers. It will not be a better version of what the world offers. You know, you're not saved so you can live in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry, and wake up the next morning without a headache. That's not, that's not salvation. That's not what Jesus is for. He helped me because I was really exhausted doing all this stuff. But, you know, Jesus just gave me the energy to get through the rest of the day. No, not at all. You've done enough of that. Don't do that. And people are going to be upset at you for not joining them. I remember, you know, experiencing the consequences of those parties and then being given an invitation Kind of a blanket invitation. It wasn't personally given to me. But come to the party. And first of all, this, we're not celebrating anything. So there's nothing being celebrated. It's just about sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking, and idolatry. There's nothing being celebrated. And I've seen the fruit of these parties. I've, I've dodged it in the bathroom every Friday morning every Saturday morning, every Sunday morning, week after week so far in my life on campus. Uh, no thanks. I don't, I don't No. And the minute you say no, you feel the, 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 the chill, the rejection, because people, they're offended by that or they're threatened by that. The world is offended by anybody, threatened by anybody who would choose Jesus over it. That's what we see. And this is a sentence that continues. So with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. But Peter has more to say because more is at stake. Here's the rest of the sentence. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. There, there it is. Judgment day. Judgment. The judgment of God. That, that's that's going to happen. That's for real. That's showing up. You're showing up to that. You're headed there no matter what. And this is what Jesus has done for you. He's he's made provision for that day and everything else that flows from it. And even that will not be your focus. Even your own salvation is not the focus of your worship. The source of your salvation. Not the blessing, but the blessers. You know, the, the, the blesser, God himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And not the salvation, as good as the blessings are, as good as the salvation is, your focus is the Savior. That's what it means to be saved. It's, it's about the Savior, about what he did. Because what he did tells us who he is, and who he is is what satisfies me. It's what fills the whole the, the God-shaped hole, if you will, put there by the Creator that can only be satisfied by the Creator, by His presence in my life, by my focus on Him, by my fixing my eyes on Him. Absolutely. So this is why it says in verse 6, for this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. That doesn't mean we preach to dead people. So, again, we're looking at the language. You have to take your time a little bit as you read it because you're reading something that's closer to the original. And so what he's talking about here is these people who are now dead, before they were dead, they were alive. And when they were alive, they got preached to. And then, even though they physically died, they continue to live now because they believed while they were alive physically, now they live in the spirit the way God does. And, and death is the thing that's described there, you know, judged in the flesh the way people are. That's every single one of us. Again, said it before, sin is the reason we die. It's the source, it's the cause of death. And Jesus is taking care of that. That's why he's so much better than a get well plan, uh, you know, seven steps to a happier life, a more joy-filled life, a more successful life. He's better than that. 
The focus has to be on him. Can't be on all the trappings. Can't even be on the denominations, the church, all that stuff. All has to be secondary to him or it's not about him. And it's all going to be stale. That's why churches become stale. Because it's not about Jesus now. It's about the trappings, the stuff, the blessings. You know, constantly talking about the blessings. Stale. The only thing that satisfies, the only place where we can get that life every time, fresh every time, always, is God himself. And, and he brings us to places, doesn't he? Because we, we want what we want, and then we get what we want, and it's not what we wanted. Stale. You know, if we surround ourselves with ourselves, make our lives all about ourselves, guess what our life is? Stale. Empty. Meaningless. Oh, what's the solution? What's the elixir? What's the cure? It's not a what, it's a who. It's Jesus Christ. Never stale. Always fresh. Always there. Always available. Always good. Always right. Always filled with love for us and putting love in us for him and for one another. And so this leads to these great, great verses that lands on these verses, that all the verses are important, and there's landing points always in Scripture. This is one of those landing points. The end of all things is at hand. So he is thinking about the end of all things, judgment day, eschatology. That's what eschatology is, the study of last things. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers over a multitude of sins. And so right here, we see these, these two things that make life different. Indicators of an unstale life. Indicators of someone being alive spiritually. And these two things are prayer and love. You can never go wrong with prayer and love you can always use more prayer and love do it more invest more time in it invest yourself more in prayer and love take these things wherever you go Head, heading into the days to come we have days that that ought to be spiritually refreshing right you got you got Thanksgiving coming up, and that could be a, a great day of spiritual refreshment. The full title of that day is a day of thanksgiving and praise set up by some of our past presidents as the law of the land that we would set aside this day. And yet, I bet for some of you, it's not going to be. The only thing fresh about that day might be some of the food. But then there's your family and your relatives and why did God choose these relatives for me look at those people over there they look at that person I got these they were here last year and I thought I paid my price they're back <laughs> and they'll keep coming back love and prayer prayer and love bring prayer into that Pray your way through that day. Love your way through that day. Love isn't some feeling. You know that. Love is something you do. It's something you are. It's something that God makes you to be, makes you to do. That makes a difference. And, of course, you're heading into Advent, too. And I, and I, I think Election Day is part of this, too. Go into the voting booth with love and prayer, prayer and love, not fear, you know, not some idea that God is not sovereign. That's not appropriate for a Christian. No, go with love and with prayer and let God guide you. Let it be about God. Let it be a God moment. Otherwise, it's stale and, and maybe worse. And all you have on your mind is doom and fear and all that. And the same can be different experiences, but the same words would be used to describe these experiences. In the holidays, there's a sense that you, know, you, can't, you can't live up to it. You can't manage it. It's exhausting. Uh, for some of us, it can be very, very difficult. 
I read somewhere, I'm going to use it somewhere in, in devotions. I, I forgot who said it. He said, don't let Christmas distract you from Christ. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Prayer and love. This verse. Do this. The two adjustments you make with the Holy Spirit's help, you become self-controlled and sober-minded. These make you available for prayer and love. That's why that other life, that life that you'd spent enough time dipping your toe in or diving in, whole hog. I mean, you, you just you, you, you dived into that, you lived that. Good. Done. Live differently. Self-controlled. Sober-minded. So you can love. So you can pray. And love can flow from that. And look what kind of love is described here. I just love this. Love that covers over a multitude of sins. How does that work? Because the only way to cover over a multitude of sins is what Jesus did on the cross. We can't do that. I can't cover over your sins. You can't cover over mine. So what's happening here? Well, if you see that love there, that love that covers over a multitude of sins, then the love and the covering over, these are both Jesus. Jesus at work. The Holy Spirit at work. If you want to combine the two, if you want to just simplify it, if you have questions, what is this? Just say love covering over a multitude of sins. That has a name. He has a name. His name is Jesus. Amen? Make it about him. Remember him. It's a day of thanksgiving and praise. Giving thanks to and for him. Praising him. Amen? Do a little tiny bit of it and watch it have a huge result. Do even more and the day is transformed. The season is transformed. Yes, there's Christmas with all the crinkles and sprinkles and lights and all the carnage. That's what my sister and I used to call it because it was just, you know, about material attainment, you know? And I was there with the rest of uh, the the materialistic world, you know, what am I going to get for Christmas? You already got something. It's someone, and his name is Jesus. And whatever you get, that can be fun, but it's not the purpose. It's not the number one thing. You know, and it gets worse, you know, because sometimes we Christianize our materialism. Lord, help me get what I want in Jesus' name for Christmas. You know, no. Thank you for whatever you provide for me, whatever you give me, because I've already gotten the best gift. It's a gift that will never stop giving. It's a gift that I'm having to open every single day of my life. It's always a surprise to me. It's always fresh. It's always new. It's always better than any other gift. It's always the thing that makes the other gifts good too because they're not as stale as they otherwise would be because I'm not making them the point of my life. I'm making you the point of my life because you are the gift of the father for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son and there's the gift and there's the wonder and there's the joy and there's the praise and now you're alive again and now you're not so bitter and you're not so whiny and you're not so angry and you're not so exhausted I look at my exhaustion levels and I think, you know what? I don't know if this is physical. This is spiritual. I'm doing some work in my life looking at, because people talk about balance. That does not exist. So it just when you hear the word balance, just replace it with folly, because there's no such thing as balance. There's rhythm. Yeah, and that's scriptural. There's seven days a week. There's a rhythm to things. Yes. But balance, no. And can life be crazy? Yes. But how is it that some weeks where the schedule is insane, I'm doing fine. And then other weeks when I got lots of room and lots of margin for everything, I'm in the dumps. And I got nothing but a complaint about every little thing. Well, it's a spiritual problem. There's staleness afoot here. I need to locate it, and in fact, I, I need to use it as a reminder to get back, to go back to him. 
I need to pray. And, uh, and, 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 and love. Love one another earnestly. That's a command, too. That's not, you know, a, a, a nice-to-do kind of thing. Mean it. Love one another earnestly. And, and then look where this goes. Now, this is kind of cool because it gives you just some, some more ideas of what the different life, the fresh life that God gives us in Christ, what it looks like. It is about Jesus, not about the life. The life follows. The life is second, but God mentions it. You know, it, it's in our, it's in our Lord's Prayer, we pray for bread. You know, Jesus said, he didn't just say, seek me first, forget about the rest. He says, seek me first. And then this is part of his plan because it's who he is. I will give you all the rest. All the rest will follow. And so we've got this different life. We're praying and we're loving and we're loving and we're praying. And here's some more of what that looks like. Verse 9, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. First thing on the list. <sighs> now some of you are good at this. You're hospitable. And I, in my own mind, am a very hospitable person. I've always thought that about myself. And yet, I, I came to, to gauge my hospitality in a different way after a year or two or three of marriage because I would watch myself and then Shannon and how we were different. And in my family, if you're going to go over or visit, you're going to plan that visit. You're going to plan that visit. If you're late, we didn't have texting back then. We would have called. We would text now. I'm going to be a few minutes late because we have a time when we're going to show up. And implied in the show up time is the get out of here time. Amen? Right? So there's a window. Now, her family's different. They just show up whenever. Hi! We're here! Why? <laughs> what? And, and I feel like the Holy Spirit's kind of, kind of rubbing it in a little bit because he says, show hospitality, and, and, the, and the verse is not done. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Come on! Really? I can't even grumble about it? No. No, because you're living differently. You got that prayer going on, you got the love going on, the love going on, the prayer going on because of what Jesus did for you on the cross. It's all about him. It flows from him. And here you are, showing hospitality without grumbling. And as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. So the gifts you've been given are not yours. They're mine. They're the, the, they belong to the people next to you. The, the purpose of the gift is not so you can display your gift and then have everyone around you affirm you in just the way you like and applaud for you. That's not the purpose. There's nothing wrong with being affirmed or applauded, except that's not the purpose of the gift. The purpose of whatever you've been given is to bless someone else. And we can get lost in this even, the, the whole idea of gift giving. You know, we want to get a lot of credit. Like it's a, it's a I'm giving you a gift, but it's, there's a, the, the bill for the gift, whatever gift I use in serving you, whatever gift I actually physically give you, the bill for the gift is that thank you, that thank you better be good because if it's not, you haven't paid the bill in full. Now that, that transactional approach, that's not what the Bible's talking about here. Give. There's no way we can approach being transactional with Jesus. Well, since you died for my sins on the cross, I'm going to go to church. Uh, right, those are two really different things. First of all, going to church is good for you. And second of all, maybe first of all, really, you could never pay the price for me paying the price for your sins, says Jesus. So you are in continual debt. And the Bible does teach that. We have this debt of love, right? This debt of love to God and a debt of love to one another. 
And this sentence continues. So each has received a gift. Use it to serve one another as good stewards. This is how you make the most of the gift. As good stewards of God's varied grace. Continues here. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. So that is the very opposite of stale. Well, that's, that's awesome. Whatever speaking you would do if you would somehow speak as a gift, probably the most powerful way to do that is just one-on-one, that one-on-one encouragement, exhortation, expression of, of love, care, concern. I mean, do that as if you're speaking the very oracles of God. Do that as if eternity is at stake and it's a life or death death issue because it is and if you're going to serve then know that you're you're serving through the strength that god gives you so uh, the the blessings here are 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 coming at you in many different ways multi-layered blessing here all pointing to the blesser but you're you're giving your gift so you're making a difference in someone else's life but you're also making a huge difference in your own because the one way to stay fresh is to do this with the love and the prayer and the prayer and the love to do this whatever you do do it as unto the lord and it's about him that's where it lands right in order that in everything is that some things is that most things nope everything in everything god may be glorified through jesus christ to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. It goes back to him. It points back to him. It's about him. That's life. That's a different life. That's what Jesus meant when he said, I've come to give them life. That's what Jesus meant when he called himself the life. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is the life. The life that flows. The the, the life of the little L that flows from the life of the big L. The life that is Jesus Christ. And it's what we mean when we say this. We in communion with Jesus Christ are a community of friends and families who love and trust him and passionately pursue the Christ-like character essential to fulfill our commission to change our lives and world for him. It's about him. We're here to live, to be alive in the source of life that is life, that is the point of life, Jesus Christ. And if you look at the the discipleship program for the next five years with these four challenges every year, the wording may change, but it's essentially similar. You know, the tithing challenge is about staying fresh in in the stream of God's blessing. Because if you hoard your your material, if you if you if you make life all about your stuff and 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 kind of keeping score with the, the the different blessings you receive whatever they are and tithing specifically focuses on financial blessing but you are guaranteed if you if you if you get that satisfaction from from money from stuff you're guaranteed to be stale that's just never gonna satisfy you, you find out, you get everything you want, and you find out there's nothing you wanted. And uh, I don't know why, for at least a, a good portion of us, we, we have to learn this lesson over and over again. We'll develop a dissatisfaction for something that we don't have, and we'll yearn after that thing, and knocking on the doors of idolatry, or opening up those doors wide open, Because we make that thing the thing that's going to satisfy us. And then sometimes God in his wisdom gives us that thing. And guess what? 100% of the time doesn't satisfy. Won't do it. Only he will. He alone. You know, outreach is the thing that 
matters to God, that we would, we're imperfect, but he's chosen us to be his ambassadors, ambassadors of grace, ambassadors of salvation. And that is so important to him. And that's about others. We love God by loving others in our tithing, in our outreach, in our learning the Bible. I guarantee you that if you study your Bible, if you learn the Word of God, you will become the better brother, the better sister, the better father, the better mother, the better wife, the better husband, the better person, the better employee. You will be. Because that's what the Word of God does. It changes you for the better. Always. Reliably. It does this. It's the work of the Holy Spirit through His Word. And, and you will be able to, I mean, the great, greatest thing sometimes is that you just can stand your own company. You're in the room by yourself and not offended. Because you, know? <laughs> you know who you are and you're not perfect. You're not there. You haven't arrived, but you know who you are. You know what you are. You're loved. And you know that. You're loved. And in being loved, you're redeemed. Not because of you, because of him. Saved, not because of you, because of him. And because it's because of him and not because of you, it's permanent. It lasts. It can't be taken away. It will never be stale. It will never feel dead. Ever. And of course, you know, you got the tithing challenge, the outreach challenge, the Bible challenge, the serving challenge. Serving. I mean, there it is. That's how we, we love God by loving others, by serving. Not for the applause, not for the recognition. The best service of all is service where you're pretty sure it's invisible to all but God. If you haven't had that experience, seek it out. Seek it out. You will find a satisfaction that, that it, it's, there's something so gratifying about it in, 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 the, in, the, in the positive sense, um, fulfilling. God does want us to experience fulfillment in him, according to him, per him, as he defines it. So it's about being stale no more. Amen? Uh, the, the cure for a stale life is a fresh desire for God. That's what Peter is talking about here. Because, I mean, why not party and do all that other stuff if there's no God? The reason we don't do that is because that's all dead and there's, there's God and he's here and he's alive and he's offering us a different way of living. He calls us to it. And it's great. If you uh, are stale in terms of your desire for God, you're going to be stale in terms of your experience of God. And again, do a survey of how you view God, what you get out of God, and try to, try to with the Holy Spirit's help, it's, it's, you're trying, he's doing, uh, try to remove all that self-helpy stuff. You know, all that stuff about self-promotion, self-actualization, bucket list kind of thing. You know, how I'm going to make myself happy. These are the things I want. Not that those things go away, but don't make those things the reason for your life. Make him the reason for your life. It goes... It goes back to, to these verses. You don't have much time. We, we all have less time than we've ever had, right, at this very second. And so, because of that, let, let's pare down what we're about, what we're doing, self-controlled, sober-minded, for the sake of prayers. The great source of all breakthrough prayer. You don't have to do it right. 
I mean, there's a template there. You want to try to do it right. But some of us, we don't pray because we, I don't know, I, I prayed. And I don't think I pray very well. Do you think God is listening to people's prayers and thinking, this guy is my favorite prayer over here. And this dude, he's just got to stop. Just stop. You, you, just stop. No more. Ugh. He's not doing that. As you, as you pray, you seek him. Prayer is a work that he starts in you. He's the one that makes it effective. Not you, not your word choice. Him. And look where that leads. Love. I've, I've needed this message, these uh, words, many, many times in my life. Even as a pastor, you think, well, you're, a, you're the pastor of the church. You, you, I mean, you should just be firing on all eight cylinders. You should just be, you know, always, like, tuned into God and what he's about. And, and then on top of that, you're, you're a military chaplain, so you kind of have that horizontal view and, you know, the things that are going to happen here that are attended to by the values of the kingdom of God, and you get to be a part of that, too. And you should just be cranking it out on fire and there's lots of times i'm there's nothing cranking and there's, there's a, bit, a little ember of something this is like just gonna go out and i look at my i look at myself and think what is wrong with me and as i can remember scripture as i can remember this as the Holy Spirit brings it to remembrance, as the Bible accidentally falls open to this page, however the Spirit works, he brings me back. He says, I want you. I've done all these things for you. I've sought you. I chased you. I went after you. I redeemed you. You were lost. You had no interest in me. You had no desire for me. I had a desire for you. I sent my son for you. Jesus is the one who said the words of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he sent me, says Jesus. That whoever believes in me, God did the sending. Jesus did the obeying. Jesus did the teaching about the sending and the obeying and presents himself still right now to you and I. Amen. Thank you, Lord, so much for what you're doing in our lives. Help us as we make a survey of our own hearts and minds. You're a good God. And sometimes our lives don't give witness to that. Sometimes our lives are about us, about small things, about secondary things. And we even take the value away from these small and secondary things. They have a value, and we strip them of their value because we're trying to get what we can only get from you from them. Turn things around in our thinking, in our decision-making processes. Turn things around in our hearts and our souls. Help us to have a desire for you Lord, it's not just Peter. We can go back and we can read about Jeremiah and the whole reason for his prophecy, his prophecy that the kingdom would fall is because the people weren't seeking you. They didn't have a desire for you. They had made cisterns for themselves that were dry, producing no water. Jeremiah's equivalent of my vending machine with stale candy. It's the same. It's the same problem. And the problem is, we're not seeking you. We're not desiring you. Would you stir up in us a desire for you? Well, the funny thing is when we focus on you, when we put our, our minds on you, when we look through the scriptures to find you, we find you and right with you, we find what you're doing for us and the chief thing you did for us, the main thing you did for us, what you did for us on the cross. So in these moments as we sing uh, this, this hymn, this modern hymn, uh, as, as we, we think about sacred things and are, are transported to beholding you, 
Lord, work whatever change needs to be made in our hearts and stir up in us desire for you. Help us to pray. Help us to love. Help us to bring you glory through it all, as the scriptures say. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen.